With its elegant clubhouse and beautifully manicured greens, Kagane Country Club is one of Tokyo's most prestigious golf courses. In the late 1980s, one businessman offered over three and a half million dollars to any member who would sell him their spot. Not one of them accepted. This marked the peak of Japan's heady trade in golf membership, driven by its booming economy. Property prices were surging, and in 1989, the Nikkei Stock Index hit an all-time high. Many believed that Japan would soon overtake the United States as the world's largest economy. Then the bubble burst. Japan's lost decades followed, marked by slow growth, falling prices, and rising unemployment. By 2004, you could pick up membership of the Kagane Country Club for less than half a million dollars, a fraction of its previous value. But things are finally stirring. Japanese equities are among this year's best performers. Inflation has returned, and exporters are rediscovering their mojo. So, is this recovery sustainable? Welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. I'm Markham Borthwick, Managing Editor at Bailey Gifford. And I'm joined by Donald Farquharson, head of Bailey Gifford's Japanese equities team. Over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll consider whether this time it's different. But first, a quick reminder. As with all investments, your capital's at risk and your income is not guaranteed. Donald, it's great to have you with us on Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So let's start at the beginning of your career in Japanese equities. You started in 1990, moved to Tokyo in 1991. Paint a picture of what Japan was like then for an equities investor. The things that I would say were striking then was, even though Japan was the biggest market in the world at the start of the 1990s, not a lot of foreign visitors to, to Japan at the time. There were three million it still felt living out there that you were living in an environment which for the foreigner was slightly alien and slightly undiscovered. The other thing that I notice, and I go back twice a year, I've just been to Japan, is how the physical environment changes. When I was there, the whole area around Tokyo Station and next to the Imperial Palace, there was a height limit of six storeys. So all the buildings were quite low. And of course, today, it is an extraordinary skyline that Tokyo has. And I, I'm constantly going back and I'm getting into areas of town. And I think, I don't recognise this and realise that it was just around the corner from where my office was. I mean, that's extraordinary that it was quite undiscovered. Because if you look back to the 80s, you had global asset allocation of about 30 or 40 percent in Japan. Why was it so undiscovered to foreign investors? Well, of course, uh, a lot of foreign investors were nowhere near the benchmark weight in Japan. That has predominantly been true throughout my investing career that looking at sort of the measures of index weights, it looks like foreigners have neglected the market and periodically as when Prime Minister Koizumi came into power and there was the expectation of reforms then uh, Shinzo Abe uh, a similar sort of reform driven market you start to see foreigners getting interested in this market again we may be going through that period again right now but I would say that there's a lot of transitory money that comes from overseas into Japan and you mentioned Shinzo Abe, Koizumi, and there have been 17 different Japanese prime ministers since you started looking at Japanese equities back in 1990, which is extraordinary. How have things changed to present day Japan? Because as you say, you've just backed. The engagement with companies has changed a huge amount. So when I was out there in the early 1990s, you could meet a lot of companies but they didn't have an IR function as such. So they often didn't really understand where you were coming from. And I remember very long, very turgid, uh, very unrevealing meetings that I would have with a lot of these companies. As an example of that, uh, you're probably aware the the biggest companies in the world at the time were Japanese banks, and yet there was no disclosure at all of their non-performing loans. And everyone knew they had them, but they didn't really crystallise in most cases until the end of the decade. It was 10 years on before we actually got to see how bad the lending of the banks had, had been. So that, that's one thing that I would say has changed. Governance has changed uh, a lot. 
In some areas, Japan has really embraced governance. They are the single biggest signatories to the task force on climate-related disclosures, TCFD. So in, in some respects, governance is very good. In some other respects, I still think it's got a, a long way to go. We're seeing a recovery this year in Japanese equities, and I'm sure you've been asked this question quite a lot during the course of your career, but is this recovery more sustainable? Is it real? So firstly, I am very enthusiastic. I think this is a really exciting time to be invested in the Japanese market. But if you look at what has driven the market, which has been a factor of rising interest rates, a a weaker currency, um, has been classic cyclical rotation. So car companies and banks and some deep cyclical businesses have done extremely well on the back of that. And these are generally not the areas that we've been invested in. The car companies were concerned that they face double pressures at the high end from electric vehicle makers like Tesla and the low end, uh, the Chinese uh, makers. The banks, nearly every bank in Japan has twice the level of deposits that it does loans. And I think that creates a really difficult environment for any lender to to price the the loans uh, at an appropriate level. And why do you think the growth companies haven't been part of this rally and how this might change? I think a lot of them have faced some headwinds because they did very well in the period running up to and and during the early period of COVID. And as things have returned to normal, growth has optically looked as though it's been slowing. Interestingly, we're now starting to see the next up leg. And that's just simple comparatives. I was in Japan in September 22, and I was in Japan September this year. And a marked difference in terms of the confidence and the enthusiasm that a lot of the entrepreneurs were exuding. So, so that's, that, that's probably why I think ultimately the growth that these companies are demonstrating will ultimately come through in terms of earnings and in terms of cash flow and, and ultimately will drive share prices. And what's interesting, a lot of these growth companies have strong balance sheets, don't they? That's a, an unusual factor, I think, in Japan that uh, a lot of these companies also have a lot of cash. That's a support to the valuation, but it's also a support to their ability to to grow because they they have the financial resources to do it and they're not dependent on uh, on external shareholders giving them more money or the banks. And Donald, let's have a look at some of the growth companies you visited when you were in Japan. Um, one company that I'm particularly fascinated by because I love photography is Olympus, and I always think of cameras when I think of Olympus. But I should be thinking of endoscopes, which are medical inspection tools which examine you internally. You should, yes. So Olympus, I met with the CEO when I was out there. So he's a German, Stefan Kaufmann, and they don't do cameras anymore. So they exited the, the camera business. They've also exited a scientific solution, sort of microscopes business as well. So that they are now solely focused on endoscopy, on making endoscopes which are used in gastrointestinal, uh, respiratory and surgical procedures. And they are overwhelmingly the market leader. Uh, They have about 70% of the global market in reusable endoscopes, which is the the main way in which endoscopy is is practiced. And it's an interesting one because their competitors are Japanese. This is an area where monozukuri, making things, there's an art, it's cross-disciplinary. So uh, the, the only two companies that make endoscopes in any size are Hoya and Fujifilm, two other Japanese companies. And you mentioned their CEO there, Stefan Kaufmann. That that sounds quite unusual, uh, a European CEO or a Western CEO in Japan. It is still. And, uh, you know, one of the things we've challenged a lot of our companies on is the lack of diversity, which is not just a gender diversity, but the fact that 
very few boards have international experience, even though their business may be internationally facing. So Kaufman has been with the company for for almost 20 years, I think. So he, he knows the company extremely well. He's uh, he's been brought in at a time where the company is having to respond to some warning letters from the FDA, which actually was nothing to do with their product. It was everything to do with their reporting. And it was a classic case of where a Japanese company believes because its product is near perfect, it doesn't need to provide all the paperwork that the regulator requires. And they got themselves into a bit of a problem. Kaufman seems to have got them back on track. It was a good time to be revisiting the company. And I'm very optimistic on a company that is lowly valued and still dominates its industry. So one interesting trend that we're seeing in Japan at the moment is we're seeing more mergers and acquisitions there than most other places in the world, actually, where the M&A market is pretty quiet. And an interesting company in the portfolio is Nihon M&A, which helps companies through the takeover process. Tell me more about them. Yes, I really like this one. And um, it's had a couple of bumps along the way. So the share price has come down a long way. And that, that sort of is what attracted us back to a company that we have followed for a long period of time. It's a great example to highlight because people talk about the demographics of Japan and invariably when they talk about the demographics of Japan, it's about this stifling growth, you know, because you haven't got a growing population, there can't be any long-term growth, a contracting workforce and the like. In the case of Nihon M&A, so it, it is advising small companies on mergers and acquisitions. You've got in Japan about three and a half million small, medium-sized companies. And it's reckoned that uh, roughly half of those companies have a CEO, founder, who is over the age of 70 and is facing a real succession issue. This is where Nihon M&A can step in. It's by far and a long way the biggest advisor uh, in this area. And uh, companies aren't concerned solely about getting the best price. They're concerned about their workforce. They're, they're concerned about the continuity of their business. And that's where Nihon m and has a skill that others can't replicate. And you mentioned small and medium-sized businesses there. And that's a great opportunity for a quick plug for a previous uh, podcast I did with your colleague Praveen Kumar on SMEs, which you can find in the library of short briefings on long-term thinking. Let's move on to another company, Denso, and they've got a really interesting history and they've got links with Toyota, and that still accounts for around about half their business. I think what's interesting about Denso, they're involved in the motor trade and you don't actually invest in any car companies in Japan, but why do you invest in Denso? Yeah, Denso is, in my view, a sort of, Toyota plus plus. So it is increasingly the added value that goes under the bonnet. That's probably a traditional way of expressing it because increasing their, their business is about the electrification of the powertrain. Very little is traditional combustion engine now. And Denso is an R&D intensive business. It spends far more on research and development as a proportion of sales than Toyota itself does. 80% of all its forward investment is into semiconductors and into software. Themselves and probably Bosch are the only two suppliers on that scale that are able to spend $4 billion plus a year on R&D. They are the ones that are adding most of the value within power semiconductors and in the ability of a car to electrify. And we talk a lot about clusters. Paint a picture to the listeners of, of what that ecosystem is like. Yeah, well, you, you've got Toyota Motor um, at the centre, or actually, interestingly, Toyota City is one place where you see no other cars than Toyota Motor cars. And around that is the, the cluster. We're talking close to Nagoya. That is the traditional heartland of motor manufacture in Japan. When I was out there, um, I actually had the opportunity to go to the research centre that Toyota has for the development of all solid-state batteries, uh, an area where 
They reckon that technologically they've invested far more, they have more patents, they are ahead of all other battery producers. And this could be the future technology that will be driving our cars. It's more efficient, it's much quicker, it's less than 10 minutes to fully charge uh, an all solid state battery. It has a lot of advantages that our lithium iron batteries uh, don't have. It's really interesting because there's a lot of focus, obviously, on the cars, but there's a whole other competitive set, isn't there, going on in, in Europe, the States, Japan and China with batteries? Yes, it's something that we've been considering in terms of how do we benefit from the way in which cars are changing. So a company like Rome, which makes the next generation wafer and devices to go in, into cars, silicon carbide, of its business is to the car market. So it is the car supplier. You know, Panasonic makes batteries for for Tesla, uh, but for also other OEMs. So, yes, the nature of that business is changing a lot. And what I find interesting about the gift off this rotation around the investment teams and investors will move to uh, different strategies. You've been focused on Japan throughout your career. What fascinates you about this country? I'm fascinated by the culture. I'm fascinated by the preconceptions that people have and hold. And I think that gives us an, an advantage as long term investors. Sometimes I have to tell people that if you look over the last 10 years, Japanese earnings growth for the market has been much higher than it has been in the United States. People don't believe that, but they can go back and check that. It's actually been true earnings growth over the duration of my career, but we're coloured by all these comments around you know, deflation and uh, the, the sorry state of the Nikkei. So it's a much more vibrant, much more exciting market than I think many give it credit for. You know, some of the changes that we're investing in, uh, in IT services, factory automation is an obvious place. There are some fabulous Japanese brands, uh, skincare being one area in cosmetics that we've been investing in. So there there are lots of uh, opportunities. It's a great hunting ground. And why is it so misunderstood? I think there is still this hangover of we still talk about you know Japanese exporters but most of the exporters don't export I mean they you know exports as a part of GDP are I think lower than they are in the UK you know so Japan does export some goods Uh, the automotive sector is one area where it does still produce cars and sells cars so people often look at the headlines, but they don't look beyond it, I think, bluntly, is why it's misunderstood. And we always end the podcast just asking our guests about what book they're reading at the moment. What are you reading at the moment, Donald? Well, I've literally just uh, put down a a book about Masayoshi Son called Aiming High, which is an interesting account of basically his life, and it's taken up to 2020, I think. It's fascinating at a number of levels. We know that uh, he was very successful very early and very prescient in his investment in Alibaba, but I think it's forgotten how frequently he made very bold calls. He was in university when he sold his first translator business, which he developed at the University of California, Berkeley. To Sharp, so he made over a million dollars while, <laughs> while still still a student in the in the very early 1990s. Uh, he invested in Yahoo, and he invested in a lot of companies that Bailey Gifford more broadly has an interest in: in Byte Dance, in Coupang, in Arm Holdings, which is of course the the company that he's just brought back to the market. So he has a very clear and long-term vision and he's prepared to act boldly and invest boldly on it. And quite typical of the alignment I guess of a lot of not just in the Japanese strategy but in terms of founder leader of SoftBank we do like founders and that's something that's become more and more concrete as your career has developed at Bailey Gifford isn't it? That's right I, I mean I looked back at our main Japanese fund uh, in 1990 and we 
only had 4% of the portfolio invested in what would have been regarded as a founder-run company. Today, almost half of the names that we hold in the portfolio are founder-run companies. So the opportunity set has changed spectacularly. You're sitting in the room with the person who set up the company and who holds the vision for where that company is going to go. That's a positive uh, way to end the podcast, Donald. Thanks very much for joining us in Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thank you. And thanks for investing your time in Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. You can find all our episodes at baileygifford.com forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other platforms. Goodbye.